Welcome back, everybody. Today, we're going to talk about the Scopes trial of 1925. It's also known as the Monkey trial <clears throat> because it was about a high school substitute biology teacher who taught evolution in his classroom, which was prohibited by the laws of Tennessee, the state. And so he was put on trial. It was pretty much a show trial because it was a clash between two things that were happening in the 1920s, a resurgence of fundamentalism, and on the other hand, a, a rise of modernism, it was called. <clears throat> Certainly in the 1920s, the jazz age, the roaring 20s, everything seemed to be new and modern in the intellectual and artistic worlds. You had people like Sigmund Freud and Albert Einstein preaching uh, and teaching ideas about relativity. You had uh, James Joyce and Faulkner creating new types of writing. You had Picasso doing it in art and Stravinsky doing it in music. And then in popular culture, it was called the Jazz Age because jazz was beginning to rise. And the Roaring Twenties, as it was also known, was just a time of love, peace, and music, uh, just like the 1960s were. And that faced this backlash called fundamentalism. And it all becomes encapsulated in the Scopes trial of 1925. Uh, <clears throat> what happened was Tennessee had a law that banned the teaching of evolution. The Charles Darwin's theory that talks about origin of species and is pretty much was even then accepted in modern biology as the way species had evolved uh, over the years. <clears throat> but the, uh, a lot of the fundamentalists were pushing back and using Darwinism and evolution as an example of what was undermining traditional values. So after the law was passed, the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, back then in the 1920s, uh, very strong, uh, advertised, tried to recruit somebody who would test the law. And Clarence uh, Darrow became the defense attorney. William Jennings Bryan helped the prosecution. But the person at the center of the case who volunteered to become the test case of this law was a guy named John Scopes, who was actually a coach at the high school and occasionally filled in to teach biology. He wasn't even sure how much he had taught evolution, but he knew he had mentioned it in the text, pointed to the charts in the textbook. And so he became a test case. When they get Clarence Darrow and William Jennings Bryan, it's clear that this is going to become a uh, national news and perhaps even a circus. Those were the two uh, most distinguished, famous lawyers on both sides of the, on either side of the modernist uh, fundamentalist divide. William Jennings Bryan had been a presidential candidate uh, three times. <clears throat> And uh, he was uh, Woodrow Wilson's Secretary of State, but he opposed World War I. Uh, he was very progressive in many of his views, but very fundamentalist when it came to religion. And he said, if evolution wins, Christianity goes. And opposing him, the lawyer for the other side, was the most famous defense lawyer of the time. Clarence Darrow had defended Leopold and Loeb in 1924, a case that Professor Gilpin will be talking about. And in his statement, he said, the prosecution was opening the doors for a reign of bigotry equal to anything in the Middle Ages. The whole atmosphere became a bit of a circus. H.L. Mencken, who was a great acerbic newspaper writer back then, came to cover the trial from Baltimore. Uh, it was the first trial ever broadcast nationally on radio. And the town where it was held, Dayton, Tennessee, did it partly because they knew it would be a good way to bring tourists. People came in 
monkeys bring and, and organ grinders bringing their monkeys, people putting on shows. And so it was a great festival uh, with 200 people packing the courtroom and cheering as it went on. Uh, what happens is that Clarence Darrow, the defense attorney, had brought in some great scientists to serve as witnesses to prove that Darwin's theory was correct. But the judge said, that's not an issue here. The law is already the law. You're not trying to put the law on trial or say that the Tennessee law has no basis in scientific fact. The question is simply, did John Scopes violate the law? It's almost like the Zenger, tri Zenger trial, which is, you know, forget about whether the law is right or wrong. You're just supposed to judge. Uh, if you're on the jury, you're supposed to decide whether the defendant broke the law. And so not being able to put any of his scientific witnesses on the stand, he puts William Jennings Bryant on the stand, the, the counsel for the opposing side, and starts questioning him about the Bible. Now, this wasn't truly necessary. Brian didn't really have to testify. But both of these lawyers are sort of getting into it as a, as a bit of a show trial. They know that they're being made celebrities. And so there's William Jennings Bryan on the right. He gets put on the stand by Clarence Darrow. And Darrow asks him, you know, are all the things in the Bible true? Uh, New York Times called it the most amazing court scene in Anglo-Saxon history. And so Darrow asked William Jennings Bryan about the Jonah being swallowed by a whale. And uh, Bryan retorts, I think it was a fish in the Bible, not a whale. And, jo and Joshua making the sun stand still. They go back and forth about the literalness of the Bible until the judge gets fed up after two hours and strikes all of it from the record and says it has nothing to do with what the trial is supposed to be about, which is not the merits of the law, but whether or not Scopes broke the law. In the end, uh, Darrow just says to the jury, why don't you just convict him? Uh, you just ask the jury, just convict my client because we're gonna appeal this to a higher court. And indeed they do appeal it to a higher court after the conviction comes in. Uh, <clears throat> Scopes had been fined a hundred bucks and the Tennessee Supreme Court in an act of true wisdom says that there's nothing to be gained by prolonging the life of this bizarre case. They upheld the verdict of guilty for John Scopes, but they threw it out on a technicality, which is that the judge didn't have the right to set a hundred dollar fine it was the jury that had the right to set the fine. But instead of uh, retrying the case, the Tennessee Supreme Court says, just drop it, just forget about it. In the end, what this does is help define the modernist versus fundamentalist street. We still see, of course, that alive today. <clears throat> Modernism and uh, <clears throat> uh, sort of new ways of looking at things versus the more fundamentalist, more traditional values. That's what's been fought out in our politics. And it was very much symbolized by the trial of John Scopes in 1925.